This video is brought to you by Adam and Eve. Use coupon code EPOSVOX at adamandeve.com to save 50% off one item with free shipping in the US and Canada. Some exclusions will apply. I've been making videos here on this whole YouTube thing for a very long time, for more than half of my lifespan at this point, which is pretty absurd. Now, I've only been doing the on-camera stuff for about half of that time, and I've only been using my main cinema camera here for a couple years now, but it's a lot of camera work, it's a lot of footage, it's a lot of production, and there is a lot of little things that I've picked up on the, along the way that I just can't live without, but they're little things that I don't always just review in their own dedicated video. So that's what this video is dedicated towards. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today, some production gear that I just can't live without. I'm Eples Fox, your stream professor, and there's a lot that I have in the studio here that are all little things you might not think about. And I'm excited to share them with you today because I feel like there's not a lot to talk about these things. So we're gonna get in with the first thing that I even used for this video, and that is a color chart. This is the X-Rite Color Checker Passport here. It has two different sides. It has the actual color chart itself, along with basically white, black, and gray levels to help you with exposure and colors. And then you have a dedicated like little white balancey bit and a focus thing to say, hey, I'm right here in focus. I have focus, pe focus peaking enabled in my monitor. You can see that pretty much this whole range because this lens is pretty weird is in focus here for the most part, or at least I hope it is. I hope I'm not blurry. That would be ironic and helps me out with that. Now, when it comes to color grading, I'm still learning color grading a lot, as you probably know by the inconsistency in my A roll. And I've struggled with it a lot with the sensor inside my cinema camera here. So. I don't, you know, get as much use of this out as I sh out of it as I should, but I have been learning and getting help from friends like Gerald Undone and people who are great at color to help me learn. And I have been slowly making sure that every video starts out with this and helps me identify, you know, where I need to be for exposure and for color, which is very, very helpful on top of the fact that it helps me make sure, like I said, I'm in focus. Speaking of which, there's a few accessories that I'm just going to cover all at once here that relate to focus that is super important when you're shooting on a manual focus only camera like this, my Ursa Mini Pro Cinema camera, or the Panasonic G7, which I used for two years prior to that, which is also doesn't, well, it has autofocus, but it has really bad autofocus, so I only use manual focus lenses with it. So first and foremost, the most important thing that I got set up with for this camera was a big monitor to preview my screen. Currently behind me, I have a big BenQ monitor that I reviewed last year at some point. Uh, I'll have a link to that review in the video and the product page for it in the description below. It is not anything special. It is not even meant for video production or anything like that. It is just a big 32 inch monitor that lets me see focus peaking when I'm in focus and everything like that. Because I've tried using my Atomos here as a small seven inch monitor and it just doesn't work for me. I don't know if it's because my vision isn't great or just because I'm not great with this, but especially when I have to like look down or off to the side at this little monitor while I'm trying to uh, focus and I can't see my eyes to focus on my eyes because I'm looking at this, I get to put this right behind my camera and basically just look right off to the left, adjust focus and I'm in focus here. And I can sit here and be like, I can tell right now that I'm in focus. Hello there. I am more or less in focus at some point in this plane here, probably right here. Hello. And I get to come back and be like, wham, bam. I can see that I'm in focus. A little monitor like this, I just can't see enough to do it. So some sort of monitor and a monitor stand for it, which I actually got a reply from uh, MKBHD's team as far as the little rolly cart they use to stand up the monitor and roll it back and forth. I'll have that linked in the video description as well. I think it's from the Vivo brand, but I could be totally wrong about that. Secondly, in focusing products, I have this guy right here. This is the Tilta Nucleus N. This is the cheaper option of the uh, Tilta Max follow focus products. This is a wireless follow focus system. And so it has two different pieces. This is the actual focus motor, motor which plugs in via micro USB. And I just have a D-tap to USB adapter plugged into my battery plate for my camera. You could use a battery bank or whatever is appropriate for you. And then it attaches to a rail system, which is through the quick release plate of my camera. I attach it to my camera and it has a little motor here, which, which clips onto the focus ring on my lenses. Now I typically shoot my videos with this Canon 24 to 70 F 2.8 L lens, which does not have focus stepping or a focus ring. Well, not this kind at least. And so I, the tilt -a kit actually comes with a dedicated, a couple of these dedicated focus adapters that you can strap onto a lens 
and then it just clips into it and starts turning your lens to wirelessly focus it. To control that, over here you have the controller here, which is wireless. It does take a battery. The battery does not last very long at all. I'm very frustrated with that and I can never get them to recharge properly for some reason. They're supposed to be rechargeable, but it can attach to a hot shoe or a cold shoe. It also takes micro USB power for charging or for power. And you just have this little knob that you could also attach to the side of a cage with your monitor. I could actually literally just mount it to the side of this monitor if I wanted. And that would give me a better time to sit here and just adjust focus right here. I don't do that. That's an option. I could do that for another setup and you control it that way. In the instance, that I don't actually have this big monitor available or I'm shooting somewhere where I'm you know, on the go or don't have that with me, I have another accessory for actually monitoring my camera's output. It's this cute little bunny rabbit looking guy right here. This is the Axoon Cine Eye. This takes the video feed from your camera and broadcasts it over 5G Wi-Fi to your phone. And then you pull up the app in your phone and you get full view and everything of your feed. It is really freaking handy. It is super small and convenient. It takes USB-C power. So again, I can power it off my camera's battery or a battery bank or what have you. It has a corner 20 thread on the bottom so I could adapt it to any cage or the top of my camera or whatever. And then power button and an HDMI input. And it compacts super, it compresses here super compact so that it fits into any camera bag or your pocket without issue. My only my only hiccup with this specifically is that my Ursa camera, this one specifically here, has only SDI output, so I do need the little Blackmagic micro converter in order to convert the SDI to HDMI for this, but that's specific to my camera, and I don't expect them to make one of these with SDI, but it would be pretty cool just to have one, so it'd be easier for me. Very handy piece of kit that any time I'm going to shoot video, this is gonna be in my camera bag because then I can just pull up my phone and I can, I've even seen people build cages for their phones that has the wireless follow focus attached. And then I have my phone monitored with follow focus and it's like you have a dedicated video recorder or something, but with wireless follow focus and coming straight out of your camera for much less cost than usually getting one of those wireless monitors and wireless transceiver and everything like that. So pretty handy. It does only really connect to your phone. So that might be a downgrade for some, or you know, a downside for some people, but I am a huge fan of this right here. It goes with me everywhere. I was using this at CES as well. Super handy. This video is brought to you by Adam and Eve. We've been in a pandemic in a lockdown of sorts for like six plus months now. And so a lot of us need a little bit more adult entertainment in our lives. And for that, you can use coupon code EPOSVOX to save 50% on your first item, get free shipping within the US and Canada. Some exclusions apply. And they have some pretty cool stuff. They've got 24 seven customer service. They've got a 90 day no hassle return policy, which is just mind blowing, to be honest. Of course, there's discreet shipping. No need to be embarrassed. That's totally fine. And 20% of their profits goes to fighting HIV around the world. So that's a cause I can definitely get behind. AdamandEve.com, coupon code EPOSVOX. Next up on my list is this right here. This is the Parrot Prompter, the Parrot Teleprompter. This is a teleprompter for your camera that actually slides onto your lens. It slides over top of it, and then it has the one-way glass, and you put your phone into it to reflect your script up into it. It doesn't show up in the video. I use it for all of my scripted videos, and it is much more compact than the other option I had. I used to have this big old contraption that I mounted my camera into, and I had a big old piece of glass, and then I used the tablet with PowerPoint for the script, and I thought that was a great way to go. It was miserable compared to this where I literally, I just slide it in front of my lens and have the script scrolling from the app. The app doesn't save settings very well and it has Dropbox support that doesn't really seem to work very well. The app isn't great, but for just basic playback, if you adjust settings every time, having this has been the only way I've been able to do fully scripted videos and I rely on it very, very dearly. And it's super cheap. It's only a hundred bucks, which compared to even the bigger options, it's way better. Next up, an important piece of my kit is a video recorder, and that actually comes in two different forms. Either my Atomos Ninja Inferno here, which takes most video signals up to 4K, 60 FPS, even in HDR, and encodes them to ProRes up to 422 or DNX HR HQX, which is really freaking handy. It takes a 2.5 inch SSD in their little sled. I have a one terabyte that I shove in here. I use, I've used this for so many projects going back to 2017. This was how I filmed the screen capture for my OBS masterclass. If I want basically the most lossless screen captures possible for tutorials to zoom in 500 times on little windows elements, this is what I go to. I use this for filming most videos out of my a6400 or my Panasonic G7 or G85. And if I just need to record a quick BIOS clip or something like that for a video, and I don't have the ability to run OBS on it or something like that, 
this is what, what goes with me instead of a full capture PC. Now, this is what I've been using for a long time, but I can now supplement it in some cases with the Elgato 4K 60S Plus. It's more or less the same concept, but records to HEVC or H.264 instead and does so to a SD card. So it's more compressed. The files don't fill up quite as quickly and it just doesn't have a screen, which in most cases is totally fine. I still run pass through HDMI into out to the normal monitor. I'm not going to use this for camera captures. You totally could would be fine, but I do use this for a lot of handy just on the go screen capture and things like that. So super handy there, usually significantly cheaper than the Atomos. Pretty cool. Does all the same specs though, in terms of actual capture up to 4K 60 FPS and HDR support. And just like the Atomos, 1440p is not supported, but neither of them do that. So whatever. Coming up on the last couple things, I don't have these in the frame because they're actually in use, but a battery bank, especially one that has like a super long battery life uh, is a key part of my kit. For example, I'm running, a, it's called Into Circuit is the brand, but it's not even available on Amazon anymore, but it's just a 15,000 milliamp hour battery bank. I use it to power my audio recorder and anything else that I need to charge or power on the go. It lasts forever. And when I'm just here in the studio powering that audio recorder, it can do weeks and weeks worth of recordings without needing charged, which is one of the biggest little conveniences here that I can get. And that's what I'm all about. At this point, I have gone through all the budget stages, you know, cheapest way to do things and whatever. And I am at the point of solving problems and making my life easier so that production is smoother and faster and I make better videos for it. And so that's what a lot of this is. In that regard, I also have two, actually I technically have three of these little impact rolly carts that I got for, as an idea from Caleb from DSLR Video Shooter. Uh, these are a hundred or so bucks on Amazon and they kind of replace your light stands and in some cases tripods. So I have two that I use in my current set down here because once we started turning my previous studio room into a baby room, it's no longer really my shooting space anymore. And I don't have the space to set up a bunch of the bigger light stands and C stands and things like that. And so I have one that my main aperture 120D here with the lantern is on. And then I could, as soon as I'm done shooting, cause this has taken up my entire living room floor, I roll it out of the way. And then I have one here that is my main recording cart. It has my A6400 on it. It has a impact magic arm to mount this Atomos recorder as a monitor slash recorder for that camera. It has my audio recorder mounted to it. And then it has a little methylene clamp here with my microphone on a microphone arm mounted to it as well. And so if I didn't want to use my Ursa for recordings, cause for a lot of my stream critique and stuff, I just use my a6400 pretty much my entire shooting kit except for a light is all contained within this one cart and with the way caleb had actually set it up he also had it set up with a light as well so that literally everything you needed was on this one cart i use a bigger light i don't have the big nice flat led panels that he has i have a big bulbous light so it didn't really work out to have the light on it for me so i have two but saves me a lot of time and i can always roll them out of the way which is great when i have such a compact space that i'm working with Relating to that, the impact, both both the little like aperture and generic uh, newer little friction arms that you can get. These are handy for little things like this little light or something, but anything heavier than that, including my Atomos, uh, these just spin out on the where the uh, thread actually attaches to the clamp. They always spin out and it's it just kept falling over all the time. And so I switched to using these impact magic arms and super clamps, and these things can hold anything. They're not as uh, flexible in terms of like the different angles you can get, but in terms of just mounting something at a few different angles and holding it well, these things hold anything. So I use one for holding my big heavy Atomos recorder here. And then I also have, you can see behind me, my Aperture Tri-8 is mounted from a shelf hanging above it with one as well, and it is rock solid. I am a huge fan of these clamps and these arms as well. They, they're just one of the best investments you can get if you need to rig things up in different places. That Aperture Tri-8 is also a huge part of my video kit. It is a nice LED panel. It's fairly expensive, but it has a great CRI. It is very color accurate, and it has a dedicated easy softbox to it that is super fast to remove and attach, but also means that I get nice soft diffuse light, even with that very small depth of space I have to work with for my main face cam shooting setup. Because the problem is when you're that close to a wall, especially without being able to bounce light off the wall, you don't have a whole lot of room to actually get nice soft diffuse light like I have here from my Aperture light. 
well, they're both aperture, but for my 120D with a full softbox and everything, well, that little softbox on it does a good enough job for a webcam frame setup. The light is really solid and has really turned around my whole webcam shooting scenario. I used a lot of different lights, even bigger and softer ones up to that point and was just never happy with the results. And once I set that up, I've never looked back. So it is one of my favorite lights to invest in. And if I wanted a more smaller compact shooting scenario, I could use a couple of those as key lights and be good to go as well. I have two little final things to talk about here that have been requested a couple times. One relates to the, my main microphone setups I usually use. I usually use for my desktop recording setup an RE20 or an RE320 from ElectroVoice. These are dynamic microphones. I have reviews of them linked in the video description. They reject a lot of background noise and provide that boomy radio sound that I prefer. In terms of equipping them, uh, my actual shock mount here is just the normal ElectroVoice 309A, so nothing special there, but I have it kitted out with some nice quality of life changes. Uh, first on the mic itself, I have the BSW Repop. This is a pop filter specifically designed for the RE20 and RE320. I actually do, I did just get the black one in to match the RE320, so I'll swap this out soon. Um, but they also fit on mics like the High LPR40, the Rode Procaster, and I've even seen people grip them around the Rode Pod mic now as well, which seems a little silly, but it is a nice pop filter that as long as you keep it with the one inch gap here, completely diffuses your plosives and you're good to go. And it doesn't take up, you know, it's not a whole fly swatter in your face and doesn't look quite as dumb as the windscreens that you put on them. So this is really key. And then I've upgraded the actual shock mount here with two products called Beta Bands and Beta Nuts. And I realized that those sound really dumb. These are replacements for the default nuts and rubber bands that come on the shock mount because they can the, the bands themselves can break easy and aren't always the best. In fact, I bought one of these on eBay used and the bands ended up dry rotting and breaking fairly quickly. I wish I had known these existed at the time because I ended up throwing that one away and wish I hadn't. Um, but these beta bands, they, they get a little sticky for like dust and things like that, which is unfortunate, but they do a great job of replacing that and honestly doing a better job of keeping the mount mic shock absorbent here. And the beta nuts replaced the top nut on this because the one that came with it uh, it just was super loose and always came loose on me and that either adds noise to the whole setup or it just keeps twisting and eventually like it falls off. I've had that happen a couple times. So this replaces that mechanism and just provides a better bolt and nut experience here, which I'm a huge fan of. And then I use these quick release adapters that podcast is actually recommended. They're like nine bucks on Amazon and you can get little microphone quick releases for if you're doing microphone swaps regularly or if you do maintenance on them or if you review microphones like I do where I'm constantly swapping it out, I can just put these in each of my microphone mounts and then have one on my actual arm and it just has a little button that quickly releases it, hence the name, and lets it loose here. Speaking of quick release plates, I cannot live without the Arca Swiss quick release system. I don't use it for my main Ursa Mini Pro camera, it's too small for that, but for literally every camera I have mounted anywhere, I use Arca Swiss plates and quick release the actual clamps for them. I use a bunch of different brands, there's no one significant brand. The only one that's unique that I have invested in is the super expensive one for my Manfrotto tripods because the ones with the knobs on the side that sticks below the plate and when you have the big Manfrotto fluid heads, that doesn't work. Like there's not enough vertical height and you can't attach those there. So I have these quick release ones from B&H that I'll have linked in the description below. They are very expensive, but they have a lever locking system instead of the knob. And that allows me to mount it in situations like the Manfrotto quick release heads where I don't have room for the knob. And so I can use my cameras on those tripods as well. So that was a good investment. I have two of them, even though they're super expensive. <laughs> Production gear is expensive. It happens. Uh, I also forgot to mention again from Aperture, but I always want to make sure my kit has some sort of extra, just small LED light. This is the ALMW from them, and it has a cool bunch of different little effects, like being a TV light or fireworks or paparazzi or what have you, or it can just be like a very small, small soft key light with this diffuser panel on it. But this is helpful when I'm doing my product shots and my product photography and things like that. Just having a little extra light that I can put into a space to either light up the logo of a product or provide a little bit of extra fill when I'm doing my moody dramatic shots. Or when I was at CES, this was my key light for a lot of stuff. Since the hotel was pretty dark and the lights in there were pretty gnarly, I just set this up on like the side of a shelf or on the couch or whatever and had it shining at me, you know, from an upward angle as a key light and it worked out fine. So always having some sort of small little controllable LED has made a world of difference in the flexibility of my production kit as well. So that's it for me. 
This started out as five production tools I couldn't live without and is now like 12 or more. Hit the like button if you enjoyed. If you have any questions or comments about these particular things, join us on Discord, eposvox.com slash Discord if you're interested in learning more. Uh, go ahead and subscribe for more content creator related videos and things like that. I do have a video finally talking about my two year experience with my Ursa Mini Pro cinema camera coming soon. I'm Impulse Fox. I'll see you next time.